Well, we can do nothing without God's help. So as we come to worship him, let's call down his blessing. Let us all pray. Lord God Almighty, Heavenly Father, we bow in your holy presence and we humbly ask for you to enlarge our scanty thoughts, to see and behold the wonders that you have wrought. Lord God, we are so often constricted and constrained and small-minded and distracted by our busy lives and demotivated by our sin and, and simply not rise up to the glories that have been revealed to us. And so we pray for your spirit's energies tonight, that we will behold something of your greatness, that we will feel the weight of your glory as you present yourself amongst us again tonight, as we are called by you as your people in your house to worship your great name under the sound of your holy inspired and infallible word in the name of jesus christ we ask this blessing with the forgiveness of our sins amen, amen. so we'll hear now this call to worship from psalm 100 make a joyful noise to the lord all the earth serve the lord with gladness come into his presence with singing know that the lord he is god it is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever. And his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Let us sing this psalm in, in metrical form as a doxology. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice. Him serve with mirth, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. say together after the intercessory prayers we come before God to ask for his blessing for his kindness to us and mainly to worship his name and to thank him for his many mercies to us let us all pray 
Lord God, almighty Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the power to rejoice at all times. Lord God, we know that this is something that we have no reason to do in and of ourselves. It is only because of your grace towards us that even in bereavement and grief and ill health and poverty and war, that we can come before you and rejoice. Lord God, we thank you that in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and in the many witnesses that we have seen firsthand, it is appropriate, it is right that we should praise your goodness, your greatness and your mercy at all times. Lord God, this is such a manifestation of strength that we are overwhelmed that we not simply sing these words with our lips, but we rejoice deep down in our hearts because we know ourselves to be your children in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord God, we do willingly enter your gates with praise. And we are resolved to praise you, to worship you, to adore you, the thrice holy triune God of eternity. We bow before you, we cast our crowns before you, claiming no word or righteousness of our own. We do not stand in our own strength before you, but we stand in the grace that you have supplied through Jesus Christ and the spirit he poured out upon his church when he ascended into heaven, a scar in his side and in his hand, and is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high. Even now, interceding for his church, his body, his bride. And so, Lord God, we pray tonight that you would forgive our sins and make us worthy to be that bride who will, at the last, be spotless and without wrinkle or blemish ready for the bridegroom who will come again as we heard so triumphantly from our brother Ron this morning. You are a proven God. What you say you will do. And as we hear your son, God the son, Jesus Christ say, I will come again to call my own to myself. We await the day with longing, with hope, with endurance, with patience, Lord God, this vision of eternity, the second coming of the great and manifest day of the Lord, gives us courage. Lord God, we pray that you will expand our vision of that day, expand our vision of you and your glory and your throne and the billions of angels and heavenly hosts that we will be united with in praise and worship of your great name for all eternity, day without end, as we pass over Jordan and as our feet are planted in Emmanuel's land. Expand our vision of this, we pray, Lord God, through the preaching of your word, through the indwelling of your spirit, through the witness of the saints, through humble, ardent prayer, through the worship of your gathered saints. Expand our vision of who you are. And what you have done, and what you most certainly will do. We thank you for the witness of the saints in the scripture record. We thank you, Lord God, for Phil's ministry on Hebrews. Those saints, Lord God, who have, despite all human odds, have won the day through faith. We thank you for Enoch. We thank you for Noah. We thank you for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We thank you for Moses. We thank you for David. We thank you for John the Baptist. Lord God, these saints who long to see the day of Christ's arrival. And we thank you for the apostles, for the early church fathers, for the reformers, for faithful pastors and elders and deacons and members and children who have loved you, who have waited for Jesus Christ's return. Who have learned and memorized and trusted your word. Who have sung praise to you across this world. 
And we thank you, Lord God, for the witness of those who have lived before us. We thank you for the witness of all those people with whom we are surrounded right now. Trophies, each one of your grace. Claimed, sealed, baptized, sanctified, set apart, consecrated for your glory, for your joyful service. We thank you for every single conversation we have with our brothers and sisters. Every single time we have the privilege of hearing them pray. Because you are at work today. Lord God, forgive our blindness to the greatness of your power in the lives of the saints. We pray, Lord God, that you will be with Phil as he returns from America tomorrow. And as he prepares this week ahead of Thursday, that you will give him a word that cannot be denied. That is from you. A word full of power and authenticity and grace and comfort. A word of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That gospel which our sister Gwenda loved so dearly. And we do pray for her family. We pray, Lord God, for Sue, for those who will come. Any visitors, Lord God, we pray that they will hear the gospel's joyful sound, which, si which shines nowhere more brightly than in the face of death. For Jesus Christ has conquered death. He has overcome hell. He is victorious over sin. Bearing the wounds, but ruling from his throne. Calling his elect to himself through his gospel by the power of his spirit. And so we pray for this family. That they will know the blessing that their beloved relative, Gwenda, knew and cherished. We pray for Kerry, Lord God. We profess our love for him. We thank you for his prayers for himself in this place. We pray you will honour them. We pray for Pam. We pray for Katie. We pray for Joel. We pray for all the wider family. Lord God, be with this family. Give them great hope and comfort. We thank you, Lord God, for hearing that even as Kerry was, was given the bad news on a, on a phone call from a nurse, he took the opportunity to tell her about his hope, his peace. Lord God, we pray that you will stay with him, walk with him through this experience, step by step by step. Let him not waver in his faith, Lord God, in his trust of you. Give him a big vision of you. You are a great God, and you are near to your children. So, Lord God, we pray for his prayer life. Help him to stay close to you. Lord God, we pray for the, the professionals, the nurses, the doctors. We pray, Lord God, they will make good, quick decisions. We thank you for the amazing technology, the equipment they have, the scanners. Lord God, the treatment methods. We pray that these may be all mobilized to help our brother be free from pain, free from cancer even. Lord God, you are the God of great things. We pray for our brother Richard as we, we consider his cancer as well. Lord God, we pray you will be with all our brothers and sisters who are unwell, who are disabled, who are grieving. Lord God, we pray that you will be close to each and every one of us. Know, help us to know, Lord God, that you know the details of our lives. You remember us. So Lord God, help us to follow that command from your word. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. What confidence we have in your character, in your covenant, and in your son Jesus Christ, in whose name we humbly pray. <coughs> Who taught us to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom 
the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's continue to worship our great God with hymn number one. Our God, thou art the Father of all who have believed. From thee all hosts of angels have life and power received. Hymn number one. sermon. Um, we are going to study the last three books of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. We're going to start the series proper in September. So this is the second of two introductory studies, which will take a, a thematic approach. This evening's readings are taken from Malachi and Matthew, Malachi chapter 4. Uh, which is the whole chapter, it's only six verses, Malachi 4, and then we'll uh, jump not many pages to the New Testament, to Matthew uh, chapter 11, and we'll uh, read uh, verses 13 to 19, and then 25 to 30. So we begin at Malachi chapter 4, verse 1. Let us hear the word of God. For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And turning to Matthew 11, starting at verse 13, we read, 
the words of Jesus the Christ. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. But to what shall I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to their playmates. When we played the flute for you, you did not dance. When we sang a dirge, you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came, eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet, wisdom is justified by her deeds. And moving down to verse 25, at that time Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for it. Let's sing together hymn number two. How oft have sin and Satan strove to rend my soul from thee, my God. But everlasting is thy love, and Jesus seals it with his blood. Hymn number two. of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi are a banquet. They're a real feast. And to whet your appetite for this spiritual protein laid out for us in these last three of the 12 minor prophets, all I want to do tonight is simply chew over some of the major themes that these books feed us. 
if we have the faith to taste and see that the Lord is good in this self-revelation, we will leave here tonight with a spring in our step. These things are so exciting in both their challenge and their comfort that they bring us, that I'm confident that the Spirit will use these to bless us. If you don't yet believe in the God of Jesus Christ, I humbly ask you to open-mindedly consider with us the proven greatness of our God, who calls himself Yahweh, the great I am, the one from whom all reality flows. And so in this second introductory sermon, before we get stuck into Haggai in September, the three major themes that will savor together tonight are covenant blessings, covenant loyalty, and covenant fulfillment. Within our first theme, covenant blessing, we'll briefly consider three gifts of God, the covenant blessings of Yahweh's name, Yahweh's temple, and Yahweh's Torah, name, temple, Torah, within blessing. So to our first channel of covenant blessing, God putting his name upon his people, consider for a moment how holy God is. And then think about how small and sinful us humans are. And now ask yourself, isn't it jaw-dropping that God would have anything to do with us? And isn't it even more staggering that he would associate with a group of sinners so intimately that he calls them by his hallowed name? Ponder the sheer grace of condescension in this association. And we see this grace writ large in the pages of the post-exilic prophets. Take Haggai. The whole book is just 38 verses. And the name Yahweh occurs 34 times. Being called by the covenant name of God was a huge advantage to the Israelites. They knew themselves to be under Yahweh's protection. They had the honor of representing him to the world around them, called to reflect his beautiful character and to model his law of love to the nations who are always looking on. And when Zechariah turned up, even before he opened his mouth, he communicated by virtue of his name, Zechariah, means Yahweh remembers. Isn't that lovely? To be called Yahweh remembers. Our reading from Malachi earlier promised God would send a future Elijah. And which name literally means Yahweh is God. Or Yahweh is my God. So the people were, were constantly being reminded that God's covenant name was their pride and joy. That they also were the apple of Yahweh's eye. This naming of God's people after himself also highlights the prophetic theme of election. God chose Israel out of all the nations. Well, more than that, he formed them from one pagan Chaldean Urite, Abram, to be his son. A second facet of God's superabundant blessing towards his chosen people was the temple. The prophets were zealous for the temple of God, and they were burdened about the people's attitude to this central means of grace, this channel of blessing down to his children. God was not Israel's redeemer God in name only. Yahweh was no absentee father. He 
deeply desires to be amongst his people, intimately involved in the details of their lives, the lives of his precious children. And perhaps the most striking symbol and manifestation of God's presence was his temple. But just because we are given a blessing from God doesn't mean we appreciate and cherish it as we should. The opportunity was given to the generations who God brought back from exile to rebuild the altar, the temple, the walls of holy city Jerusalem. What an honor to be called to function in this way. Remember how the people sat down and wept by the rivers of Babylon. Far away in a foreign land. But now they were miraculously brought home. But the attitudes the prophets observed were not a sense of profound joy that, of, that God had been good to them. <coughs> not a deep sense of gratitude driving them on to greater and greater service. No, rather Haggai and Zechariah at the time of Ezra and Nehemiah then Malachi, about a century later, were faced with a people who often prioritize things other than the temple. This outward lack of zeal belied a deeper deprioritizing. A deprioritizing of God's presence and a lack of holy passion for the right worship of his great name. This context motivates the main thrust of Haggai's challenging prophecy to God's people. Is it a time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? The third way we can see God's blessing of his people is the excellent gift of the Torah. The ancient scriptures were a manifestation not only of God's care of his people, but also of his very presence. In the Jewish mind, the Torah functioned as a, as a kind of portable temple. By rehearsing, meditating upon, memorizing, singing, and praying the scriptures, God's people could, could know the Lord's presence with them and rejoice in his closeness to them. But if the temple and Torah were both manifestations of Yahweh's holy presence with his people, this inevitably came with huge consequence. The two consequences of God's direct presence with his people that our, prof our prophets, our prophets touch on are challenge and comfort. Challenge and comfort. One of the most vivid visions of the power and relevance of God's word, Zechariah 5, depicts the scriptures as a, as a terrifyingly huge flying scroll, reminiscent of a fiery angel of death. We read, I see a flying scroll. It shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. Now a parent who never challenges the misbehavior of their child is neglectful and ultimately unloving. God is neither. He challenges his people with his presence as seen in temple and Torah precisely because he loves them. And he knows that their greatest good is to be in the presence of the thrice holy triune God. And with the challenge the God who puts his name upon his chosen people, tabernacles with them and shepherds them with his living and active word also brings comfort <coughs> in and through these same means. We move on now to our second major theme in Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, covenant loyalty. I want to draw out this theme by briefly examining three of God's concern expressed by our prophets. Purity, hope, and kingship. P 
purity, hope, and kingship. So first, the purity. A distinctive feature of the Reformed Church is our heavy emphasis on the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. But we must never misuse this precious and pivotal truth. The Bible teaches our choices matter. Deuteronomy is explicit about the consequences that follow the actions of the people. Moses is crystal clear in Deuteronomy 30. I call, Moses says, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life, loving the Lord your God, obeying his voice and holding fast to him. For he is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land of the Lord, that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. There is a constant call to purity. This purity is called for in both the worshipping and the ethical life of the community. It is the heart of his people that God most desires their undivided loyalty and devotion, a life full of worship, a life that demonstrates the living out of covenant responsibility. To put it, an, uh, to put it another way, lives that prioritize what God prioritizes, justice, mercy, truthfulness, integrity, charity, hospitality. Ethics are a form of worship. Sadly, these are some of the ways the post-exilic communities failed to be loyal to their God. And these failures are clearly linked to the hardships they were facing, including devastating crop failures. But the prophets never paint a completely black picture of the church's situation. God's people are called to repentance, to renewed purification, to obedience, and through it, God mercifully lavishes his blessing on them. All is of grace, but we can't get away from the clear deuteronomic principle of reward for heart obedience. As we talk about prayer, as a divinely ordained means by which God executes his will, so also we see that heart obedience is a way under the Lord's controlling providence that God channels his blessing down upon his beloved people. The second place we see the call to covenant loyalty is in a context of real challenge, the call to hope in God alone. Specifically in the backdrop of God's hiddenness. When the temple rebuilding was eventually completed, we read a simple record of its dedication as follows in Ezra 6. And the people of Israel, the priests and the Levites and the rest of the returned exiles celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. Although a joyful scene What's striking is how different this event is to the dedication of the first temple when a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. This cloud pulsing with light was a dramatic manifestation of the glory of the great creator God. But when the much smaller, humbler second temple was dedicated, no such thing as the Shekinah glory occurred. And this is emblematic of the feeling that people had at this time, that God had somehow withdrawn from them. This sense of God's hiddenness was a threat to their hopefulness about God coming good on his promises. Remember, the context is one of years of hard work under the constant worry about financial 
and physical security. Famine and conflict are, are heavy burdens. And the people often seemed jaded, disillusioned, discouraged, and doubting. Seemingly unfulfilled promises made this people lose zeal for the living in the light of God's promises. And so skepticism crept in. Their love had grown cold and their hearts bitter towards God, tempted to accommodate the world around them. And into this context, Malachi's book catechized the people in God's elective love and their obligations under the covenant. This moves us on to our, our third motif within covenant loyalty, kingship. Now, Zerubbabel is a fascinating character. He was the grandson of King Jehoiakim of Judah, and so a descendant of David. Born in Babylon during the exile, Zerubbabel traveled to Judah after King Cyrus II allowed the Judean captives to return to their homeland to rebuild the temple. Haggai identifies Zerubbabel as the governor of Ju Judah after the exile. So, he's from the great Davidic line of kings, but in the historical record, he's just a governor of Judea, which is not any more a sovereign state, but a semi-autonomous region, one amongst many in sprawling Persia. But if we ask if Zerubbabel displayed covenant loyalty, which is surely a biblically wise way to assess any man, we see that he did display this, not least because we witness conspicuous blessings given to him. He is described as God's signet ring. And as a special word spoken to him by a Haggai, be strong, Zerubbabel. Despite Zerubbabel's loyalty, the people were sometimes disloyal and required correction. Although we don't see wholesale rebellion giving themselves over to idolatry, they were much better off now than under the evil kings of the past. The more subtle issue now was renouncing split loyalties. The loyalty to keep up their end of the covenant was often lacking. And so God used his prophets to call the people to repentance, just like John the Baptist did later. Elijah, the herald of the king, who famously preached a baptism, a washing of repentance, a calling of God's people back to covenant loyalty. As we come to our third and final major theme seen in our three prophets, covenant fulfillment, I don't actually want to introduce anything substantially new in the time we have left. I just want to signpost ways the themes we've already observed are developed and glimpse something of how the Bible ties these threads together. So, let's take the first of our three ways we see God's covenant blessing on his people and how he fulfills his promise in this awesome fact that Yahweh has put his name upon his people. If you have a Bible, please turn to Zechariah chapter 10. It's only 12 verses long, and we find here a sobering but deeply hopeful speech from God about he, how he will restore Judah and Israel. Look at verse 6 and see how God emphasizes that it is he and he alone, the Lord, who will rescue, restore, and redeem his people. I will strengthen the house of Judah, and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back, because I have compassion on them, and they shall be as though I had not rejected them. For I am Yahweh, their God, and I will answer them. There are 23 references to Yahweh in these 12 verses, by his name or by a pronoun. This focus reaches its crescendo in the final verse. God tells his people, 
I will make them strong in Yahweh, and they shall walk in his name, declares Yahweh. That's an action worth grabbing onto, isn't it? They shall walk in his name. So say you meet a new, pers a new person this week and mention to them that you're a Christian, a Christ follower. Take seriously the gravitas and the glory that is in saying, I am a Christian. Because you are taking God's name upon yourself. In a real sense, you are claiming to represent God and you are claiming God's protection over you. Of course, specifically, you are invoking God the Son's title, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And Jesus, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves. So, in a stunningly beautiful closing of the loop of promise and fulfillment, when God said, two and a half millennia ago, and they shall walk in his name, for us to say, today, I am a Christian. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, of Christ Jesus. This is literally to say, I am a follower of God's Messiah, Yahweh, saves. Let's move on to the second of our three ways we saw God's blessing on his people and how he fulfills his promise in the enthralling motif of temple. The dwelling place of God is a sacred space, a place where we see nothing less than heaven and earth intersecting. Bethel, the very house of God, and the gate of heaven. Turn with me to Haggai chapter 2. Haggai chapter 2, the second temple, as we said, had a smaller footprint, uh, much less architectural splendor than King Solomon's temple. We know Haggai was well aware of this disparity. So why does he say in the Holy Spirit about this second temple, the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. As we noted earlier, Solomon's temple, a true wonder of the ancient world, nicknamed the joy of all the earth, was filled with the awesome Shekinah glory. But no such thing happened at the dedication of this smaller second temple, did it? But five centuries later, a Jewish baby boy was brought into the temple. This temple, as thousands of others were. But this particular child was taken up in the arms of a faithful old Israelite who the Holy Spirit used to prophesy over this child inside this second temple. My eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. God had gloriously returned to his temple in human form. Christ, as the true temple, is where we see nothing less than heaven and earth intersecting the very gate of heaven. Let's progress to our third of our three ways we noted God's blessing on his people and how he fulfills his promise that what we refer to as the Torah, but more generally is God's holy word. Malachi has much condemnation for those who justify their sins before God. But there is this small section at the end of chapter 3 of Malachi. Turn there if you will. It speaks 
of a small remnant of faithful people within the visible church and see the final words of the chapter. A book of remembrance was written before him of those who feared the Lord and esteemed his name. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. Please note how the scriptures connect faithful, loyal service with God's pleasure in owning his true people. The fulfillment of God's promise to feed his people with his word is seen here in the post-exilic community. But so much more fully in Christ, who is the word of God incarnate. Not only is Jesus Christ the fullest and final revelation of God's word, but he also fulfilled the Torah. In his passive obedience, as he willingly subjected himself to suffering in fulfillment of the scriptures, and his active obedience, he lived out the ethical life of a perfect son, true Israel, serving the will of the Father. As we see these demonstrations of God's blessing in giving us his word, bursting full of God's promises and subsequent fulfillment, let's preach to our own souls this fact. Our God is a proven God. And let's cherish this covenant blessing, the gift of his incomparable word, both written and incarnate. Let's move on now to consider the bold calls to covenant loyalty in our three prophets and see how God follows through on all he says about it in Haggai, Zechariah and Malachi. Now in its simplest form our call is to trust and obey. This is precisely the same in every generation of God's people. But on a deeper level, what our prophets unpack for us is how purity in worship is in a dynamic relationship with purity in ethics. Of course, as we consider our holiness, we behold Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. But consider how Malachi condemns the people. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? We don't sacrifice lambs, do we? Our righteousness is in Christ's once for all sacrifice. But this doesn't mean that this challenge is irrelevant to our modern context in Cardiff today. The core of the issue is honoring God. It is the fear of the Lord. Malachi 1.6, as a son honors his father and a servant his master, if then I am father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? says the Lord. Time and time again, the scriptures connect a person's attitude to worship with the ethical life they live. If our hearts wander from God, if we have split loyalties, if we don't elevate Christ in our minds and hearts, moment by moment, our sanctification is under threat. You can't grow in holiness outside the sphere of worship. Or look at this dynamic the other way around. If we give ourselves permission to get addicted to the fleeting pleasures of sin, our hearts will inevitably grow cold in worship and devotion. We see this connection in the dramatic moment when Christ 
made a whip with his own hands and drove out the greedy business old, uh, owners, the con men, out of the temple. Christ sees no separation between moral living and prayerful worship. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. This brings us on to the second way God calls his people to covenant loyalty by maintaining hope in him despite his apparent hiddenness. We remember that elegant definition of faith as the assurance, the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. And the not seen aspect was something that the post-exilic generation seemed to struggle with. And if we're honest, there are times when we struggle with the fact that God obscures himself. Add to this the perennial complaint Malachi describes in chapter 314. This is the complaint of the people. It is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? Evildoers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. But see the light, brothers and sisters, just a couple of verses later. Then those who feared the Lord spoke with one another. The Lord paid attention and heard them. These loyal people knew where to find blessing in stressful situations. Active, prayerful, waiting on the Lord. A calm, content, stillness as they understood themselves to be little children under the care of their almighty Heavenly Father. Gathering to talk together, to pray together, to honor and worship God together. Yes, God is hidden in many ways. But he is always near his true children. Even while the people were back in exile, God promised to them through the prophet Jeremiah, when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you. We have to seek. And we have to do so with full hearts. And God has promised. He has promised when we seek him with all our hearts, undivided loyalty, he will be found by us. What a promise. What a promise that is. What motivation could we need more than this to be loyal to our God? To be resolutely hopeful. To perpetually bring the Lord our single-minded devotion. And so we reject the temptation to hedge our bets and to trust Yahweh and also our puny household gods of human strength and health and wealth. This history gives us the focus we need to point blank refuse to split our loyalty. And finally, and with this I'll finish, our third way, God shows his faithfulness in covenant fulfillment. We consider the loyalty of the king and our loyalty to God's anointed. Zerubbabel, a surviving descendant of David, has the honor of being referred to as God's signet ring. And we find this appellation in Haggai 2, verse 23. I will take you... O oh, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. And this memorable phrase uh, points to a glorious reversal of cursing to blessing, because it refers back to one of the last kings of Judah, 
pre-exile. Jeremiah proclaims God judge, God's judgment on this king. As I live, declares the Lord, though Coniah, now Coniah is another name given to uh, Jehoiakim, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, although you were the signet ring on my right hand, yet I would tear you off and give you into the hand of those who seek your life, into the hand of those of whom you are afraid, even into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So isn't that a wonderful thread that God ties up? God's signet ring, a king who was rejected, was torn off pre-exile and now is restored in faithful Zerubbabel. God's signet ring, post-exile. The signet ring of a king was used to, to push into hot wax to form an exact imprint that conferred royal approval and authority. But all the human kings failed, didn't they? David committed adultery, bore false witness, ordered murder. Solomon died with hundreds of, of heathen wives. Zerubbabel is called the provincial governor. No human king <laughs> proved to be the exact imprint of God's regal nature. So let me finish this overview of God's covenant blessing, his covenant call to loyalty, and his faithful acts of covenant fulfillment with this glorious description of the Messiah. God's Son is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And it is he who upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. This Jesus, great David's greater son, is worthy of our respect. He's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our loyalty. He's worthy of our allegiance. He's worthy of our hope, of our love, of our undivided devotion. Is he not? And our eternal praise. Amen. Let us sing to the glory of God, hymn number three. Thou, Lord, did say to David's king, Come, take by me the honoured seat. Sit thou henceforth at my right hand, till all thy foes be at thy feet. Hymn number three. <laughs> Thank you.
grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>